Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and 6 to 9. Hear now the word of God. So now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to observe, so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must neither add anything to what I command you, nor take away anything from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord your God with which I am charging you. You must observe them and perform them, for this will show your wisdom and discernment to the peoples, who when they hear all these statutes will say, surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call to him? And what other great nation has statutes and ordinances just as just as this entire law that I am setting before you today. But take care and watch yourselves closely, so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and to your children's children. The New Testament reading today is from the Gospel according to Mark, the seventh chapter, verses 1 to 8, 14, 15, and 21 to 23. Listen now. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There's nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. But the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. These, my friends, are the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, friends, it is wonderful to be with you today through the wonders of technology. And as much as I'd love to see each of you in person, I'm grateful for the opportunity to keep these connections alive across this big country of ours. So let's spend a little time together exploring these passages I've just read. But before we do, let's open with prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, open our hearts and minds that through my words and in spite of my words, your word may be heard. Amen. Well, do you remember a time when you wanted a little one's attention, perhaps to come inside? Do you remember when you called and called and thought you'd made yourself clear only to be ignored as if nothing had been said. Then you may have gone to this little one and taken his or her chubby little cheeks gently in your hands, directing their eyes toward yours, and saying quite plainly, Listen, we're going in now. Do you understand? Sometimes it isn't easy to be heard. Sometimes we need to be very specific. I was reminded of this when I read the Markin passage for today. 
Now, I'm confident that most of you here who know me are not at all surprised that I chose a New Testament passage that is probably not on the list of top 10 favorite New Testament passages. But you know I love taking a second or a third look at some of the unusual texts. And so I ask you to assure those around you who don't know me that it's going to be okay. Now let's dig in. The Markin passage in chapter 7 tucked away in between an amazing array of stories of miracles and feedings in predominantly Jewish territory and an equally amazing set of stories about miracles and feedings in Gentile country is a story of interactions. Mm, Well, an argument, really, between Jesus and the Jewish leaders of the day and between Jesus and his disciples. Chapter 7 is replete with passages that are ripe for rumination, contemplation, and sermonizing. This verse I've chosen to have us focus upon is verse 15, which I translate this way. There's nothing outside a human being which by going into them can defile them, but the things which come out of a human being are what defile them. Yeah, I can almost hear you saying, what an odd choice of a passage. Why did she choose this one? Well, look at verse 14. Here in the midst of this story, 7, 1 to 23, we read, And he, Jesus, called the people to him again and said to them, Akusatemu, listen to me and understand. Think about it. Upon reading this verse, I thought to myself, surely he was looking them in the eyes, proverbial cheeks in hand, and saying, listen up. What I'm about to say to you is very important. So, friends, I'm asking you and I this morning to listen up. What's going on here? Let's begin by seeing what led up to this statement. So let me set the stage. In a study of Mark, what we see in the first six chapters is the evangelist presenting Jesus as a great teacher, leader, and healer, one whose acts of love and mercy are incredible, and one who is perceived to be such a threat that already by the sixth verse of chapter 3, the Jewish leaders are trying to figure out how to destroy him. That's fast. But his work goes on. And we read of the teaching and the healing and the ministering to the crowds. We witness the feeding of the multitudes in chapter 6, his walking on the water, calming the seas, and wherever he goes, people bring their sick that they might touch even the fringe of his garment and be made well. Now here we are with the story in chapter 7, this betwixt and between story. Just after the healings of chapter 6, and just before his extensive trip through Gentile regions, where we will see him exercise demons from the daughter of a Gentile woman, heal a Gentile man, and make his way through Gentile territory and feed another multitude. But here we are in chapter 7, and what appears to be at issue is an argument over purity. Seems fitting when you think about it that this story is here between stories about those who follow Mosaic law and those who are not familiar with it. And what seems to be going on is that the leaders are criticizing some of Jesus' disciples for not washing their hands, not following proper ritual according to their traditions. Reading between the lines, we know that this is actually a criticism of their teacher, of Jesus What is Jesus' response to this question or accusation? Why do your disciples not live according to the traditions of the elders but eat with unclean hands? Well, the answer is not what we'd expect, is it? Rather than offer a reason or an excuse, Jesus quotes from Isaiah and turns the argument upside down. The religious leaders are arguing that the followers of Jesus are not following Literally, the text says, are not walking by the traditions of the elders, which to them are holy commandments handed down at Sinai, along with what is in the scriptures, and so God-given. 
Jesus' response is a quote from Isaiah which accuses them of teaching their traditions of men as if they were commandments of God, of substituting human commandments for divine teachings. There's some tricky wordplay going on here, for this is just the opposite of what the Pharisees believe. It's interesting to notice, I think, that Jesus turns the argument from the Pharisees' focus on what passes through the lips and whether it's clean or unclean to the idea of honoring God with their lips but not with their hearts. What began as a challenge by religious leaders regarding a hand-washing ritual has escalated to a countercharge that the scribes and Pharisees reject God's command in order to establish their own tradition. And I think what we have here is a failure to communicate. What Jesus was calling tradition, human tradition, made by leaders, was against God's command. But from the Pharisees' perspective, the oral tradition, or the tradition of the elders, as it's called here, was not human tradition at all, but rather itself was God's command revealed at Sinai and transmitted alongside Scripture. And it was Jesus' teaching that was human tradition. Oh, traditions and rules, but whose and why? Note that Jesus goes on to reinforce his point in further in the discussion in verses 9 to 13, which I didn't read today, but you can check that out for yourself later. And then, just when you think we might come to an understanding about which rules are right, voila, the leaders disappear from our story. And we're left here with Jesus and his followers. And here we are at verse 14. And what we as hearers of the text, and no doubt those who were with him that day, what we pick up on is the impact of his words in verse 14. As he looks that crowd in the eyes and says, listen up, listen to me and think this through. Listen to me and understand. There's nothing outside a human being which by going into them can defile them. But the things that come out of a human being are what defile them. Now, you know me well, so you know there's homework. Not only do I want you to read verses 9 to 13, a little more homework is this. For the sake of time and homework opportunity, I omitted verses 17 to 20 also. But I think it's important for us to know that in these verses, Mark confirms our idea that this saying is a bit elusive. In other words, we're not the only ones confused. In fact, he writes, the disciples asked him about the parable. Yep, once again, they didn't comprehend on first hearing this parabolic statement. You might even remember that in Mark's gospel especially, the disciples often miss the point. So we're in good company here. But in the verses we did hear today, in verses 21 to 23, Jesus goes on to make his case and hopefully shed some light on his parabolic statement. Here he catalogs a series of human offenses, the likes of which my friend and New Testament scholar Joel Marcus describes as, quote, depicting the interior of the human being as a Pandora's box, a cave of malignancy, unquote. A list of vices indeed. But let me be clear, I don't think the point here is that we are creatures of total depravity, a la Calvin, with hearts incapable of producing good. No, the point, I think, is that we all, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, women and men, all of us as human beings, should be concerned not about how or what one should eat, but rather the internal corruption of anthropos, human beings. This word for human being shows up 11 times in this little chapter, surely an indication of its significance. And it's this malignancy enumerated in these final verses that chokes the life out of tradition, turns it into an enemy of God, contorts it into a way of excusing injustice, and blinds those afflicted by it to their own culpability 
for the evils that trouble the world. In other words, my friends, we humans are a mess. Such brilliant pedagogical style this Jesus employs. Notice, if you will, that Jesus responds to the criticisms of the leaders in the pedagogical style he so often uses. He doesn't answer the question they asked, but rather answers the question they should have asked or at least direct them to what he considers the more salient issue. Jesus' response is not in direct response to the original attack. Remember that one, eating with unwashed hands? It is instead the issue about which they should be concerned. In other words, the issue is not who is clean or unclean, who is ritually pure or defiled. We all, says Jesus, are defiled, and not by what comes in not by what we eat or drink, not by what rules we follow, but by what we say or do. Jesus is getting to the heart of the matter here. If we listen, if we pay attention and try to understand, perhaps we can begin to see our shortcomings and our tendency to focus on that which is not the heart of the matter. Jesus seems to be saying to his followers then and now that there's a strong correlation between doing and character, between being and character. We cannot, should not, hide behind our words, our rules, our traditions. Rather, we should examine ourselves, our speech, our actions, to be sure that we recognize our brokenness, the brokenness of all humanity, and are willing to dig deep and examine what lies at the heart. Don't mishear me. There's nothing wrong with rules. We make them to keep order, to have a safe existence. But when the rules result in our loyalty to the rules rather than to one another, we have missed the mark. Think about the words from Deuteronomy you heard this morning. Think about why God gave the rules. Give heed, the passage says, to what I'm teaching you so that you can live in the land I'm giving you. You've seen the good that comes from this. Be diligent and pay attention and don't forget. Teach them to your children and your children's children. So why do we have and create the rules? Why do we build up sets of tradition? Is it to keep account of who's in and who's out? Who's right and who's wrong? Maybe not originally. They may begin as ways of helping us get along in the world, but over time, we can lose sight of that, and they become ossified and without life or meaning, other than they are how we have always been, how we've always done it, what we've always thought. Too often, the rules we create in love, in life, in church, in politics, too often, the rules we create and hold on to, however well-meaning they may be, bind us in and prevent us from loving rather than freeing us to love. When times are tough, as Lord knows they are right now, and we're feeling pressured or threatened or argumentative, we often focus on one aspect of a situation and fail to see what really matters. We're quick to judge others, to lump them into categories of those who always do this, or never do that, or so foolish as to believe this, or so foolish as to believe that. We spend so much time and energy building our cases and going on the attack, we fail to see our own myopic tendencies. How often do we waste our time arguing about the easiest target, the easiest thing to decry, setting up your rules versus mine, and we miss what is really the issue at hand. We miss what is really the heart of the matter. This, my friends, is no easy story. And the focal text, the parabolic statement of verse 15, is not easily explained. But let's be sure of a couple of things. One, this is not merely a conflict story between Jesus' followers and Jewish leaders. It's far too easy to point a finger at those awful Pharisees. But what Jesus does is incredibly instructive, pedagogically astute, and really important for us to hear. So listen. Listen 
and understand. This is not an argument about your rules versus mine, about Pharisees versus Jesus. The lesson here is about what lies within each of us, each of us as human beings, then and now. And second, this is not a story of how horrid we all are or how beyond hope we all are. It's not about total depravity or a declaration that we humans are absent of goodness. Instead, the story teaches us that it's not in the following of any particular set of rules that brings us closer to God, closer to being the people we are called to be. That comes from within. That is really a matter of the heart. So how willing are we to move the conversation from what we've always believed, what we've always done, to a conversation emanating from the best of who we are and with the hope of reflecting the imago Dei each of us bears. In the end, it isn't the rules we follow or even the words we say that reveal our true nature. It's the actions that make up our daily lives. You can't put that on a checklist, print it up, tick it off at the end of the day. If we really believe this, then the good news that I bring you today is that we are capable of getting to the heart of the matter, and goodness can abound. Micah said it well. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Listen up. This is the heart of the matter. May God grant us the wisdom to hear and the courage to do. Amen.